Wow, it's great to see you again. It's been years. Yeah, it's been a while, man. It's really great to see you. I, I've been so surprised by the, the growth of uh, arm wrestling on YouTube, and I was shocked to see that you had a channel as well. Yeah, and I've, I've half-assed it. Life's been uh, really busy for the last few years, so I come and go. How many kids do you have now? You, I think you, there's Herman th the third, and there's, there's others as well. No, no, no. There's just one. We're only having one. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm busy enough. Well, I, I'm sorry to hear about your house in Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, man, this is crazy. Uh, we spent seven months in a trailer, and I mean like a tiny trailer. And uh, But I've been in this house for about two months now, so um, things are getting better. I just got to go through some legal stuff, rebuild a couple properties, and I think ultimately we'll be better off financially, but kind of sucks in the short term, you know? Of course. So just to briefly introduce you, Herman, to the show, so my channel is mostly about – Actually, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's mostly about pharmacology. Um, I mostly focus on uh, the pharmacology of health, like medicines and things like that. But we also talk a lot about steroids. A lot of my listeners are steroid using uh, strength athletes as well as bodybuilders. And I've been trying to introduce them to arm wrestling slowly. And I've been a little bit successful. People are getting into arm wrestling as well. And I thought that it would be awesome to have you on, not just because I knew you, know you personally, but also because... For the audience to know, I think that you may be the strongest natural arm wrestler in the world. And you, you, at, least, you, at, least, you at least have some claim to that. And in addition to that, you're also one of the most uh, contrarian people in the arm wrestling world. And one of the few top American arm wrestlers who refused to join WAL. So there's a lot of interesting things going on. But I wanted to, to ask you beforehand. Well, first of all, I want to tell the audience there's a channel called Herman Stevens II. And before we go on, I want to comment on that. You don't use the title junior, which is no. really interesting. Yeah, how did you decide to use the second? So I've been thinking of naming my son after myself, but I don't like this junior thing. I don't like to. Yeah. I think I think typically when the second is involved, um, the name comes from an individual that is not the direct father, right? So yeah. I think generally speaking, if you had a child, that child should be a junior. You should be a senior. I don't know if there's any hard rules over it, but, uh, you know, my dad was named um, after his uh, stepfather and he was Herman Stevens Jr. And um, when it came time for me to come around, he thought I was going to be the third. But for some reason, they said, well, actually, the step grandfather and my dad's middle names didn't line up. So they weren't going to name me the third. So I became the second. So it's kind of like a glitch in the uh, naming system. And, a, uh, are you biracial? I, I'm biracial myself. It's affected my identity a lot in life. Are you? Uh, it's complicated. So I am 100% black. Oh, I'm right. Black. Yeah. And so it's a complicated subject. People don't really know the history, but, um, you know, so let's say I'm from Louisiana and I live in Louisiana. You go back to Louisiana in maybe the 1800s or something like that. And you had three races of people. Right. You had white people, you had African slaves, and then you had like mixed people. Mm. Right. These are mulattoes, mestizos, creoles, et cetera. When the United States bought Louisiana, um, the United States didn't have this three tier system or this three category system. The United States had a binary system. Mm. You were either white or black. And that's where the one drop rule sort of got applied to Louisiana. So if you had one drop of African blood, you were then black. So there were a lot of people like me that were then simply considered black, regardless of the mixed ancestry. And so, um, you know, my grandparents kind of looked like me. My great grandparents kind of looked like me. My great grandparents looked like me. But these people are all black. And um, and that's the identity. I mean, that we've lived under and part of and we celebrate and we're proud of and that sort of thing. And if you come to Louisiana, there are a lot of people that look like me that are 100% black. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is that the black race in general, whether you look like me or Kobe Bryant or Shaquille O'Neal, those individuals are not 100% African, mm -hmm. right? The average black American that you would typically think of in terms of a darker skin tone, mm -hmm. that individual is probably 10 to 20% European anyway. Um, in my particular case, uh, based on the 23andMe genetic testing, um, I'm 45% European, something like 35% African, 
and uh, 10% Native American, you know, give or take wow. some percentage points. Also, we may comment that the people in the South, white Southerners often have a little bit of African ancestry as well. So I have some family from Alabama who I was helping with their genetic uh, research, and they've been trying to disprove their 2% African ancestry when in reality. And and there's a lot of people that that's a problem. Like there's some, there would be some self-hate associated with it. Um, And so America is different, right? If I go anywhere else in the world, I'm probably considered white. Um, you know, by general skin tone standards. But I mean, there's like a conflation of nationality, ethnicity and race. Right. Mm-hmm. And those those are three different things, especially in the United States. Right. Exactly. So racially, I'm black, ethnically. Right. I'm a lot of stuff. Where are you from in Louisiana, by the way? Is it Baton Rouge? No, I'm from Lake Charles, Louisiana. It's okay. it's really like an industrial city, maybe 80,000 people. I think the metropolitan area is like 250,000 people. So fairly small for someone like yourself, you know, maybe that's, are you still in the LA area? Yeah, I've moved to Irvine, but I've tried to escape LA a little bit, but it wasn't so successful. Yeah, so very small compared to where you're at. So uh, w- the reason I ask is because I, I was listening to Neil Pickup's interview of you, which is fantastic and deserves far more views. And I highly recommend to the listeners to listen to it, to get a proper accounting of your life that's chronological. But I was fascinated to learn that I've always noticed that you had a Southern accent. I thought it just came from Louisiana, but mm-hmm. I learned that your father was a cowboy and that you grew up on a like rustling cattle and stuff like that. I grew up a little bit in Colorado and I did I learned how to rope cattle a little bit. But that was really fascinating to me. Whenever I thought of Louisiana, I thought of the Baton Rouge dangers. It's one of the it has one of the highest murder rates in the US. Um, that area. Did you yeah, grow Baton up Rouge in New Orleans is pretty it's pretty wild. But you grew up far from that. Yeah, I'm probably 2 hours from Baton Rouge, 3 hours from New Orleans. Um, we do have our like city limits. We do have our poorer areas here. Um, I did live in some of those areas growing up. You know, I remember, you know, I think I was in second grade and you hear a gunshot next morning on the news. You know, you figure out someone shot a pizza delivery guy, you know, probably walking distance from the house. And then like your neighborhood can't get pizzas delivered anymore. Right. So I got a little bit of that stuff. Again, nothing on the the scale of Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And then I also kind of did grow up some some. Uh, a bit in the country. How, there's an interesting part of that interview in which you describe gaining weight intentionally as a youth because you were watching strongmen, like you were learning about strongmen, you learned that they ate a lot. You skipped the steroid part, which we'll get to later, but you decided to eat a lot. Did this yeah, happen? I don't, yeah, I don't. <laughs> what was that? I don't know. I don't know if it was that intentional, but I mean, there, there's you know, there's so many different ideas. Like eat all your food, no matter what. Right. There's some of these ideas that come around. There's the idea that these guys eat 10,000 calories a day. And you're like, wow, this is how you get big. But I I never looked at a scale, you know, as a child and said, I'm going to gain 10 more pounds because I need to be the next, you know, Magnus Samuelson. Right. But those ideas were there, you know, and they're still there for adults. Right. You know, you you watch your favorite uh, bodybuilding or arm wrestling or strongman influencer and they show you the food they're eating. They don't always show you the other part of it, you know. The pancakes, yeah, exactly. but the but the question is, were you gaining weight to? F- what interested you in strength originally? Was were you like being bullied or fighting or something like that, or was it purely an inspiration of lifting things? Yeah, I don't think I was bullied too much, but when I was, it was because of the way I looked. Right, I was always in like all black schooling, and oh. so like, I mean, like what you see now is like slightly tan, right? So I was even whiter than what I am now, and I was always like the smartest kid. So. You get picked on a little bit, you kick some ass and then people leave you alone. But um, no, I think I always wanted to be strong. I think it was just, you know, watching these guys on TV. It was also the type of work I was doing at home. Like it helped to be strong, you know, in a general sense. Yeah. So I think things just kind of like they feed into it, feed into itself, you know. That fascinated me because I'd never heard anyone say they gained weight intentionally as a kid. And I had done that myself. I was being bullied. I was, I'm your, your height and almost the same dimensions as you, same wingspan. Apparently you're six, three and I'm six, two and I'm five, 10. So, um, it, it was, I actually gained weight and I got fat. I made myself fat as a, as an 11 year old, a 12 year old to try to defend myself, which is what I found fascinating. But, um, so I wanted to ask you, how did the, the, physics and engineering come about what attracted you to because i know you're an engineer and i wanted to introduce that to the audience it's unusual i think in arm wrestling although arm wrestlers are a little unusual in general 
Like they're not so much like the football jocks. They're they are unusual people attracted to arm wrestling. But you're an engineer. Are you a, a, an oil engineer? Do you work in the in the oil field? I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I've mostly worked in the oil industry. Currently, I'm in downstream chemicals. Um, but yeah, mechanical engineer by degree. What interested you in physics in in, in high school? Was it a natural interest in physics? Um, engineering. How did you? Yeah, I, was, I was I was I was always smart. I mean, like I, I didn't have to work at this stuff. You know, um, you know, if you had to look at like priorities and personal drivers, I was very achievement driven, driven as a young age, because, mm. you know, you make straight A's and people go, wow, you're smart. Right. So as a child, these things or these are good. You know, you want to hear positive things and you want, want to be celebrated. So it's like, OK, if I make straight A's, I get this attention. Right. I didn't have to study. Um, you know, I, in, fact, in elementary school, I was always like at a post high school level on reading and math and all this stuff. So like in elementary, I was as smart, you know, as most high schoolers and people in college um, and high school came around. Nothing really changed there. Although, if you, you know, if you like talking about the race stuff, you know, I remember going from an all black, historically black Catholic school to an 85 uh, percent white um, black Catholic school specifically. That's yeah, a new this is very, it doesn't even exist anymore. I went to two of them. The first one shut down. The second one shut down due to low enrollment and funding and that sort of thing. Very unique stuff. <clears throat> so when I went to high school, 85% white, you know, I remember being told, you know, um, that uh, there's no way I could be black if I was as smart as people said I was. Wow. You know? And, you know, it, it's just, you know, I don't know, this might be off the subject matter, but. No, uh, that's a very interesting subject. Uh, yeah. But it's just interesting how these dynamics are created in, in, in young people. Right. If you would ask anyone, this was 2005, something like this. And these are 13, 14 year olds. You would have said there's no way that generation has this type of mindset. But these were other children telling me this. And this is stuff they hear at home. But, you know, it's easy to get mad. But when you think about it, what they're trying to rationalize is, is well, they've been told that you know, black people are inferior and they're down here and they know that I'm up here. Mm -hmm. So so where does that put them? If, if I'm ahead of them. And I'm black. Do they go under me down here? <laughs> That's true. Or do they have to bring black people, you know, up to their level? And and this is a subject that's been uh, censored recently in academic research. But in the in the 90s, there was a stream of research about IQ and race, which uh, ruffled a lot of feathers. Basically, it, it determined that it was originally based in the U.S. And they were trying to show that Caucasians had an average 100 IQ on average. And then blacks had about 80 and, and the Latinos were around 90. And Arabs were around the way blacks are. And Arabs back home, where, where my father comes from, are around the way Africans are in Africa. Mm -hmm. And recently, this has been censored a lot. But it's, it's an interesting subject being an, an... Do you think that there is a racial or genetic predisposition toward IQ? Uh, I think... And again, I'm not like a... a the engineers are practical, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I take science and apply it. I don't necessarily well, do from your science. experience is what I mean. If you, but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. So my terminology may not be correct, right? So to answer that question, um, I think it's it's too complicated of a subject. There's too many uncontrolled factors. Um, you don't have um, a sample size from each race that is uh, basically identical or, or developed in an identical situation as this other large sample, right? So you don't have a thousand black people that are developed in the same way as these thousand white people. I think to truly do that, right? I mean, ultimately what you have is, uh, you know, large samples of people that are completely different backgrounds and different contributing factors that would impact IQ. So you can't really base it on race, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I don't know if I'm explaining that correctly, right? But on average, right, if you look at net worth <clears throat> by race uh, in the United States, I think the average white household, um, is worth $100,000. The average black household is worth about $0. So can does that have some impact on the development of a child and their IQ rate? I would think so, because you have uh, nutritional factors, um, you know, how many parents in the household, which is partially related to net worth, um, you know, schooling. When you have a net worth community, because we still are a segregated society, net worth communities don't have great schools because the property values aren't high. They don't generate the same property taxes, so you don't get the good teachers. There's right? a tremendous amount of confounding factors that come exactly. along. Exactly. So I don't think you can truly do this, but um, if someone actually had a study that 
somehow could adjust for all these factors. And um, there was a lower IQ for a certain race. Um, that may be possible. And then it goes back to, you know, what is IQ and is IQ really something special and there's different types of IQ and then what's, you know, you, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, That's absolutely true for sure. Yeah. So I, I don't think it would ever confirm that someone is lower or better than anybody else. Um, I think ultimately it would, if, if you could even do it to begin with, it would come back to, Hey, we're probably different and there's nothing wrong with being different and it's all great. Right. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. But why, why engineering? Why not finance? I mean, if you, if you were looking for a stable oh, profession, oh, that's so, so um, probably oh, science. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I don't, I don't think, you know, like I, said, I went to a really good Catholic school. I don't think they were really great in terms of guidance and counseling. Um, my mom was a teacher. My dad did not uh, finish college, but self-made entrepreneur does very well for himself. Um, but no guidance, right? My parents were, you know, you need to excel, you need to do great, but you figure it out, right? And uh, there's pros and cons to that. So when I left high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, right? I said, oh, I'll be an engineer. I'll have a guaranteed job, guaranteed salary, all this good stuff. I'm good at it. Um, you know, uh, on the physics note, um, I took AP physics and, um, we had these uh, like cards in high school. And if you did something, um, you broke a rule, the teacher would sign your card, right? This was a bad thing. And if you had no signatures on your card at the midterm, you could skip one of your midterm exams, right? <clears throat> and um, physics and calculus was kicking everyone's butt because um, you have to have that, like, it's a whole different way of thinking. You start talking about um, limits and, 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 and derivatives and all this stuff. So we were all adjusting. All of us were very intelligent people, but we still had to make that transition from basic stuff to advanced stuff. And, um, others, most of the students in these advanced classes had their get out of jail free card and they all used them to skip calculus and the physics midterm. Right. I, I had my card and I chose to skip home ec. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah, I thought it was so dishonorable when I, because I'm, I'm, I'm such a contrarian person and I don't, I don't have to try, but if I have an option, I will, I will choose, you know, to be contrarian. Usually I just end up that way. But I said, wow, these people, they're cowards, you know, they're running away from the hardest tests that we have. I'm going to take the test. And um, at the time I was working 40 hours a week just to push myself again, just overachiever. I'm just going to do more because I can do more or I can see if I can do more. Mm. So I'm working 40 hours a week. I'm in every club. I'm class president. I play football. I'm in all the hardest classes. I still choose to take the test. And I don't remember what I made. Right. But I made better, I think, than the, the, the lesser students that didn't have a choice on skipping the exam. Mm. And um, there's something called like the state rally. So Mr. Zebley uh, approaches me, he says, I want you to represent the school for the physics state championships. Right. And I said, Mr. Zebley, right. <clears throat> you should choose Josh. Right. Josh is a much better student. Right. Horsepower wise. I think we're pretty even, but I got so much stuff going on. I don't study as it is. Um, you should pick that guy. And Mr. Zebley refused because, uh, you know, I shouldn't say Josh's name. Josh might watch this. I think Mr. Zebley thought Josh was a coward, maybe. Right. Or at least he didn't take the most honorable approach. So Mr. Zebley sent me to the physics state championships. He said, here's all these books. You need to study this on top of what we're already learning. Of course, I didn't study any of the material and I won the state championship. Right. So I'm a physics state champion in high school. So the things they were just easy. Right. You got a lot of uh, positive feedback in that path. But in, yeah, college, yeah. in college, did you, did you, didn't you when you were taking like matrix algebra or did you ever think of taking real analysis? Hold on one second. Okay. You can tell, tell Leo, tell Leo good night. That's H3. Say good night, Leo. Hello, Herman the third. All right, go see mommy. Um, wait, my wife's pregnant and we're going to have a child in the next eight weeks or so. My first. Oh, congratulations. Time. Thank you. I'm really excited to join the club as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so 
So I was asking you why, I mean, this is really off topic, but I was just curious in college, when you took those math classes, matrix algebra and stuff like that, did you ever get curious about real analysis and going a little bit further in math or in physics either? No, no. For the purpose um, of learning? At, at some point, this um, achievement driven, uh, these drivers changed, right? Or at least just they skewed a little bit. I still maybe cared about the achievement portion, mm. but to this day, I'm extremely freedom and principle driven. And I don't think college aligned with any of that. Um, the, just the, the, the homework, the tasks that didn't matter, the, you know what I mean? It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's tedious. It wasn't always practical. Um, I had internships really early on in the type of field that I was going to go into. And it was clear that what we were learning wasn't always going to apply to what I was going to be doing in the future. So then there just became like a huge disconnect and like irony, right. Over the type of work that we were doing. So like, I really like didn't care after a certain point, if you understand what I'm saying. You find yourself doing that at work too, thinking a, sim a similar path about, about like your career progression and, and your demands at your jobs. Well, maybe we can't talk too much about that, but um, I found myself like that in private equity. I found a lot of my work tedious and, you know, not helpful toward the work. And I found myself um, not as interested in it. This is sort of the way you describe about it. Just to be clear, you, you find maybe some of the tasks you're doing not directly impacting the bottom the line. Yeah, the of the company. company. Interesting. Yeah, I think at times I may have been there, but man, I've really... It seems like I always find like the right, right position. Some of it, I think it's skill, some of it's luck. And I think some of it's like people trust me to do what I need to do. And so I typically find the autonomy to do exactly what I think is right at the time that I think it's right. Um, and that's the only reason I'm still in industry. Interesting. Right. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering because somebody like yourself, so free thinking and contrarian, I would have assumed you'd have you'd have trouble being in a in an organization like that where uh, contrarian attitudes would be not so desired. I would assume. But move, moving back to athletics, so how did you get into powerlifting? Before we talk about arm wrestling, and and how did you get into powerlifting, and why did the break happen with powerlifting and arm wrestling? Is it because okay, so? So I've never competed in uh, powerlifting. Right. Um, I did some power lifts for football in high school. Yeah. Um, and again, like unorganized, really low level strength and conditioning um, per our coaches. So just not great stuff. I think I could have been a lot stronger. Um, and then uh, I enjoyed that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but you go to college, you take more courses than you're, you have to because you, you push yourself. You work 40 hours a week just because. You don't necessarily need all the money. Mm. So these things fall fall to the side. You uh, you get out of shape. You uh, lose but motivation. You, you, you blah, continued blah, blah, blah. it in Bakersfield, right? You were still in the beginning. Yeah, you were, but, you were doing at home. Yeah, but so the start of it was my one of my close friends. We moved in together probably in 2010, and we were hyper competitive. Oh, okay. Right. And so basically we, we woke up together and it was like, okay, what are you doing today? Okay, well, I'm doing that today, right? Or I'm going to do more today. And um, we did that for a year. And I mean, pretty sure, you know, I went from like a 315 deadlift to like a 550 deadlift in like 10 months or 11 months or something like that. And so it was just that type of like hyper competitive environment that yeah. really like, took it overboard. In the same time, that's when I found arm wrestling. And, mm -hmm. um, and by the time I got to Bakersfield, I mean, it was mostly maintaining. I wasn't training powerlifting. I would just go to the gym, lift as much as I could in a short amount of time as I could so I could get back to arm wrestling training. Right. Was it the combativeness, combativeness of arm wrestling that attracted you to it more than powerlifting? The, the element that it had, uh, it was a combat sport to some degree and it allowed your competitive. Definitely. Cause I mean, growing up, we, we played basketball, we played football. There was always that man on man. I mean, although they're team sports, you mm -hmm. typically have your, your assignment, right? You have that guy, that either you have to defend or take out of the game or block or something along those lines. And I personally find that way more interesting than uh, simply lifting weights. Um, and I think at the time I was bored in college and it was either going to be something like, it was probably going to be judo or some type of fighting. 
Um, but I found arm wrestling instead and I preferred it as opposed to uh, potential head strikes or something like that from some type of a martial art. Okay. Um, and then by the time you met Scott Mendelson, you were not that interested in powerlifting anymore, I assume. No. You know, it, it, and if anything, it was only to maintain general strength to support arm wrestling. Okay. And I, I, so before, I'm not going to go through the whole history, but in your time in Louisiana, one thing that interested me was your discussion about being sort of uh, beaten up by uh, Craig Toulier, uh, but like uh, you were agreeing to, obviously, but he was doing hits on you. And you described like, so I wanted to know, did this benefit it, be- benefit you in the long term? Because reflecting on my arm wrestling training, which was short, it was only a couple of years, I found that actually going to practices, from the time I began arm wrestling, I actually got weaker. So I went to I went to practices once a week and I would get beat up by everybody because I was slightly more muscular than than the other people and weak and weak comparatively in arm wrestling. So people found it fun to I think you know yeah. hit hits on me. So I was getting weak and not able to train properly the remaining days. And now when I heard you reflect on your time comparing the time with Craig Toulier and the time in Bakersfield where you were the strongest guy in your in your group, is there a, a place for that? being being hit on all the time when you're a beginner i i think you have to kind of just take what you what you have around you and like find the find the the positive right so obviously i I said i found the positive in getting stress fractures from pulling craig the way i was pulling craig Um, i don't think you have to do it i don't think it's necessary um at the same time if i did not do that in that environment at that time there wouldn't have been anything to fill the gap for those learnings, right? Now I could have now, if at the same time I took away the hits from Craig and Krasi Miracles to Dinov was in Baton Rouge and he said, Hey, here's how we're going to train. Then yes, that would have been better, but that option wasn't there. Right. It was, you can learn this lesson <laughs> the hard way, or you don't learn a lesson. I see. And, how did you, being a, an average sort of, not average completely, you have long limbs, but an average heighted person. Well, by the way, let's ask a question also. Do you think that in arm wrestling there should be weight uh, gaps or or height? I mean, uh, weight classes or height classes? Do you think that height classes are more appropriate? Because I've been thinking about this recently. There are all these tall, lanky people that appear in classes and cause problems for everybody. I feel, I, and somebody else was mentioning height classes. I think this is a very responsible uh, approach to it. Do you think it's not? Yeah but, then, yeah, but then let's say you got two six foot five guys. One's Georgie Tautiev, who's 180 pounds, and the other one is Devin Larratt, who's 293 pounds, and you know his neck is this fat. Yeah, right? we're going to discuss that. I, uh, yeah, so so like that wouldn't be fair either, right? And uh, I don't I don't subscribe to the long arm advantage thing. Um, and this this kind of goes back to physics, right? Like yeah, short, short leverage, all that stuff like that. You don't, you don't have leverage on someone with a short limb. It's the exact um, opposite, exactly. Yeah, you might if they have a small hand and you can take advantage of their hand. But there have been plenty of people who did not simply say, "Oh, my hand is small, I can't do it." They said, "I'm just going to do it." And then you have Rustam Babayev, who's arguably the greatest arm wrestler of all time, who has a tiny hand, and it doesn't matter, yeah. right? Um, I think you have freaks across the board, short arm, long arm, doesn't matter. And um, I think that's really who rises to the top is people that truly have the ultimate genetic cards, right? And it's going to be their limb, their limb configuration and their leverages, where their tendons attach, how their nervous system works, the muscle fiber composition, um, the mental ability, right? Whether it be technique, um, like fight mentality, aggression, um, Which you, know, you have, I, I think, one of the best mental approaches to arm wrestling. Really, I've I've watched a lot of your arm wrestling. You're extremely mentally agile and perceptive, and quick thinking. Which not many arm wrestlers are really. Actually, a lot of them are stuck in their ways. But but how did you come up with your arm wrestling style? Which is very, it's a little bizarre. You have like really strong hands, and you developed a, a like a side movement. I mean, how did you come? How did it form? the style, this unique style? So I trained under Craig and uh, Craig is a side pressure machine, but he's really more hook, right? So like, even if he's trying to go high, he's still hooking. And, um, you know, and, you know, T 
teaching is difficult, right? Teaching is very difficult. Um, and there are very few good teachers in American arm wrestling. And, uh, and so I'm not picking on Craig. I don't know if he's a great teacher, but, you know, I keep, kept asking questions, you know, what are you doing? How are you doing it? And he said, watch Ingen Terzi. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's what I did. Like I watched a lot of Ingen Terzi and, um, that's what I tried to model my move off of. And uh, I'm sure it's changed over the years. And as I work around injuries, it changes even more. But I never in, my head, a yeah, in my head, that's what I'm trying to do. And of course, based on what my opponent gives me, it's going to look a little bit different. Well, you bring up injuries. I thought maybe it's a good time to mention. So you've recently made a video about the... Uh, so Engen, Engen recently in the last three months has been um, upset about the King's move and making some videos about it. And you discussed the King's move in a video also. I wanted to ask you something that really stopped me from arm wrestling. The, the way I stopped was because I noticed one day that Vosgen's arm didn't stretch fully. And so I inquired about it and he didn't seem too bothered about it. Well, for me, as arm wrestling was a hobby... I'm very concerned about losing like dexterity and losing my ability to use my limbs. So the first question is this, is arm wrestling a natural movement in the sense that like, have you ever watched mass wrestling? Yeah. Mass wrestling, I feel is, is something that one can actually become strong at without hurting themselves. I wonder if it's possible to become strong at arm wrestling without injuring oneself. Is it? Or does everybody have shoulder and elbow damage that's irreversible? Yeah, I, I, I think the idea of injury it. is probably consistent across all sports. Um, and I don't know if you really get around it. Uh, basketball players, right? I mean, you see them. They're sitting there. Their knees aren't the same. You know, you can watch the old guys. They're limping or their legs are bowed out and all this other stuff. I don't even think you – I don't think you can get around that – if you're going to be elite at anything, you know, sports are high impact. They are hard on the body. Um, even things like jogging, right. Or marathon running that seem low impact. It's low impact, but it's like thousands of cycles, right? No, they so have you, heart problems. They have heart problems. Yeah. Yeah. That too. Right. But you, even on the body, you would say, you would think a 110 pound man, this is low impact, but I'm telling you, I know, I don't, I don't, I haven't researched it. So you might know it better than me. I bet you those guys have joint problems. And, and no cartilage left, not a lot of weight, not a lot of impact, but so many cycles. So I think if you look across the spectrum, super high impact, low impact, anything elite, I think you're going to have issues. I think it's just the nature of the beast. So the question is, does using this injured arm or letting your arm not heal when it's not totally straight, which you brought up in a video, I never heard anyone say that before. I was thinking that the whole time. I was thinking, I've been noticing Devin's arm not extending properly in the last few years. And I was thinking, this guy's doing this intentionally. I think he's holding his arm up and letting it heal like that. And then I hear a professional arm wrestler yourself mention in a video, so confirm my suspicions that this is possible. You could be doing that intentionally. The curiosity is... it. it does that allow arm wrestlers to have a future when they may not? And is that a reason to support the move? Like if you can't. Yeah, yeah. So, arm- so like, yeah, it's, it's a, le- it's a legitimate path. I think that you could simply not let things heal incorrectly and you can become a better arm wrestler. I don't think that exists in any other sport. And it crossed my mind because I've had some hard matches in the last couple of years. I remember in 2018, I pulled Robbie Burnett. And my arm didn't want to go past this for about 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. And the only reason it went back to what is my new normal, which is not necessarily terrible or great at the same time, um, is because I forced my arm open. Every day I'm rubbing it, I'm holding weights and like trying to stretch it out. But I'm thinking if, if I was Michael Todd in 2004, was Michael Todd doing what I was doing to open my arm mm-hmm. or was Michael Todd just going, Oh man, this fucking hurts. <laughs> and you just, it just stays that way. Cause that that's what happens accent too, actually. you know, and that's probably what happened, you know? So um, I think, I think people can do that. I think you can simply, you can choose to let it heal incorrectly or you can just let it heal incorrectly. Cause you don't know any better. It would have been very simple for me to go, okay, it's going to fix itself. And then two months go by, three months go by, and then my arm is fused. 
Now, now that's the elbow. But the thing that concerned me the most, to be honest, was the shoulder from hits and because I kept getting hit all the time. But also, just generally, the side pressure movement seems to me, especially for people with wide clavicles like myself, to be just a very unnatural movement for the shoulder. I'm also like naturally bad at bench pressing. If I bench press, I get shoulder problems pretty quickly. Mm. What's you know for the for the audience that that are novices that are trying to arm wrestler. Uh, how, and you have, uh, like, I think, really advanced, sophisticated uh, thoughts about training. How can one train and program their, their their training over time to have a harm reduction protocol about their shoulders and their elbow? Like, in terms of practice? I mean, if, yeah, if anything, I think it comes down to, to balance, right? If you're doing a, just a, a ton of front shoulder work, I don't care if it's arm wrestling or bodybuilding, you've got to train your rear delts. You have to balance your shoulder out. Uh, I can't think of how many times I've gone on bench press cycles and I get some shoulder pain because my front delt is so overdeveloped. I'm a, I'm a, when I'm lifting my front delt, you know, it's like That's inches either. taller than my bicep. Like it just grows. And sure enough, I get shoulder pain. I do two sets of rear delt work. It tightens up the rear muscle. Pain goes away. Right. I think people really ne- uh, neglect the idea of balance. Um, mm. And I truly think that solves most of your problems. Um, you know, bicep tendon issues, right? Are you training your uh, triceps, right? These kinds of things, forearm issues, golfer, uh, like golfer's elbow. Are you training the opposite side of your forearm, tennis elbow, vice versa? Um, I think most of these things come down to imbalances. Um, And I'm not going to, you know, go through every balancing exercise, but I think that's what it comes down to. My thoughts were that you, the best way to protect yourself is to be stronger than your opponent. Because there's a simple sheer tension issue. If you're getting hit to the side hard enough, your sh- your elbow will be dislodged slightly each time. If you're strong enough, that won't happen. So I was thinking that, to be honest, the best way is to arm wrestle less and train more overall. Arm wrestle less and train more? Maybe, but I mean, there's, there's different schools of thought. I mean, you have people like Krasimir, yeah. who's a multi-time world champion. He mostly arm wrestles. And you have Todd Zilla, who mostly lifts weights. So... I think ultimately they're accomplishing the same goal, getting attaining strength. They're just doing it in two different ways. Um, but personally, I don't think I've ever had any shoulder issues related to arm wrestling. Oh, right? really? And I, I would bet, I would bet I train like this internal rotation stuff more than probably anyone in the United States. I, I, I'd be willing to, to bet on that. Um, now, do I have a great uh, recovery model and a, a, a therapeutic model? I don't think so. It, you do Ryan's uh, thing that uh, that weird lift that Ryan uh, Bowen does as well for this side pressure. What side That's, pressure like this? Yeah, that lock thing, whereas the break arm. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think I do it. I don't. I don't do it like Ryan does. But I mean, I've, I've been doing all this stuff before anyone put it on. No, YouTube. I'm joking. I'm, I was just joking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've done all that. I, you know, I've, I've grabbed a stack of weights, you know, 140 plus pounds, and boom, right? I've even done it this way, which is really painful. Boom, done tons of internal rotation, thousands upon thousands of reps, sometimes three times a day. So I've beaten up the internal rotation thing as much as probably anyone could. Never had a single shoulder issue. Now, again, I don't, may not have anything to do with any recovery practices. Maybe I just have good shoulders. I think so. Yeah. Right. So you have to balance that out too when you're watching gurus, right? People will tell you, you can do this. This is great. But that guy may just be built to handle it. I think so. Um, How did and I've told people that? before, I think my greatest gift is durability. I don't think I'm the strongest guy in the class or even the smartest guy in the class, but I think I'm more durable than most people. No, you might be the smartest guy in the class. I think so. But but how did you develop that three times a day thing? You, you first told me about that in Vosgan's gym. I'd never heard about anyone doing it. Now I realize yeah, Krasimir so, does that too. But is, is it were you influenced by the Bulgarians? Indirectly and not arm, and not Bulgarian arm wrestlers. Bulgarian lifting, I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And um, so 2010-ish when I was in college and, and with my roommate, we were following T-Nation.com. Are you familiar with T-Nation? Yeah, of course, of course. I was yeah, T-Nation, Biotest, Christian Thibodeau, all that stuff. And Christian Thibodeau was the man on the site. And a um, lot of great training protocols, a lot of interesting stuff, at least that I don't think I was seeing anywhere else at the time. And then ultimately, you know, his principles came down to perfect rep, high frequency training. And then, you know, if you dig into it, Christian is, was uh, an Olympic lifter who trained under the Bulgarian system. So indirectly, this stuff ultimately comes from Bulgarian stuff. So the big question that I really want to ask you is, 
so basically I have a I have a personal opinion, which is that I think that if you were using steroids, you would have defeated Todd Hutchings a while ago. And you would be potentially the best person in your weight class, which could remain the same weight. As you as you've mentioned before, Europeans know how to use steroids better than Americans. You could stay the same weight. You have a big mustache. I've always wanted to have this mustache, by the way. And this this is related because that mustache speaks machismo. And I bet you your wife tries to get you to cut that mustache. Or maybe when she first met you, she probably does. You go against society's opinions on that. And you like a strength and machismo. Why were you not interested in using testosterone? Naturally. Especially being someone that you say was not gifted with strength naturally. I mean, maybe you were. But you, you compare yourself to RVJ sometimes and say, I don't have those tools. But you could have some tools that you could use your mind more to differentiate yourself from your competition through adding more variables in your competition. What is it that stops you? Um, I don't think it's the idea that steroids are bad or any of this other stuff. Um, I think there are, there's probably a right time to use it, right? And I think that's different for different people. Um, I think that I'm going to be better off long-term. Like my peak, my highest peak possible is not using steroids today or 10 years ago. Mm. Right. I think if I use steroids starting here, I get to this level. However, if I wait 10, 15 years and get to this level without it and then use steroids, right, I become something like stupid. Right. That's so I think, I think using steroids early, I think will pull forward gains that you could have had uh, naturally. Um, whereas waiting and attaining that highest level naturally, I think you become superhuman. Um, and, and, and maybe it doesn't work that way. But that's what I programmed into myself personally. Um, and again, I'm probably mostly comparing myself to people that are nowhere near my level that use steroids. So that's not a good example either, right? I would need to really compare myself to a Herman, who is as smart, as strong, similar natural gifts, who also used it at a young age, and then see how that plays out. Um, I think there's this other idea um, that let's say if I used them at 20, had a huge progression curve, went to the top of the world at 25, and now I have nowhere to go. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Form wrestling potentially gets boring. Um, it's your hobby, after all. You need progression. Yeah. And then and that's the thing. So I think I have an infinite progression model by delaying this. Um, that's very reasonable. As long, as long as possible. So let's say I make it to 32. Let's say I make it to 40 or 45 um, before crossing the line, so to speak. Man, I've got another 15 years of fun, you know, after crossing the line. Uh, so. I should caveat one one thing. I, I really agree with your, your methodology, your th thinking process. There's one thing, though. Steroids work much better when someone is in their early 20s. I, you've seen what happened to Levon, for example. That can't happen to a 40-year-old. It's a growth hormone also especially doesn't work very well when you're older. So there is, but, uh, but I agree with the rest yeah, of no, there's a, Oh, and there's a trade. Yeah. There's a trade. And I think, I think I'll take the infinite progression, right? In a, in a 30 or 40-year career, yeah. then a five-year blast, and then it's a situation where I'm probably just not in the sport anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I think there, there, there's also a lot of unknowns. I think it's uh, this idea of using steroids. It's not as simple as I'm going to do a cycle. No, no, Which it's is, really that complex. Is, yeah. Exactly. That is the only question most people ask. No, I, or, I, masters, by the way, have no idea what they're doing with PEDs. I, this is one of the things I really, that's why I want to do a little bit more arm wrestling content on the channel. I, I wish that we could teach arm wrestlers how to use PEDs. And also, they're using very limited PEDs. There are far more PEDs that could be used. I think the Russians are using some of them, but not all of them. There are nerve growth factors. There are uh, opioid receptor uh, upregulators. There are tons of things that could be used. And in America, they use them like bodybuilders do. I think they actually take advice from bodybuilders. Of course. But, yeah. so, and and know, they don't I'm plan not, ahead. And so, for yeah, example, you I'm mentioned not, before that if you I'm start a ready. cycle, you're going to be on one for the rest of your life. That doesn't yeah. necessarily need to be the case. So, for example, most people who use steroids decide to shut off signal to their testicles while on steroids. They say, I'm going to go on steroids, then I'm going to do a PCT. Well, PCTs don't work. 
that doesn't work and you're going to feel horrible afterwards and you're going to go back on another cycle. But you could avoid this by replacing the signal from your brain to your testicles on cycle so that your gonads never stop working. Only your brain stops working. That's much easier, your pituitary and your hypothalamus. It's much easier to restart signaling there than to wake up dead gonads. In fact, you can't wake up by using some, so your your, uh, hypothalamus produces a signal to your pituitary and your pituitary, there's something called the HPG axis. Your pituitary produces luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. These two hormones are sent to your gonads to produce T- uh, testosterone and to proliferate and differentiate sperm. So luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, you can simply replace. So you can replace it because what happens when you go on a steroid cycle is your hypothalamus has receptors for a negative feedback signal for the production of gonadotropin releasing hormone. So when you're on cycle, you're going to have these negative feedback signals. They include androgens. People think they're usually just estrogen. But there are androgens, estrogen, there are even opioid receptors, all kinds of things there. So when you get this negative feedback, if you just replace that signal, at least the gonads are working throughout the cycle. It's far easier to stop a cycle if you do that. But most people ignore this. There's so many other things to consider. If you ever... Right, and that's, one, that's, that's one of my things is uh, I know it's complicated and I haven't done the research and I'm not ready to do the research. And even if you dumped all the research onto me and you said, hey, Here's your here's your regimen. Do this at this time. You have to, do you this have every to know day. Yourself. I am not. Yeah, exactly. I need to yeah. know what it is. But even if you could download it onto me, right? I have to be in a situation where I'm ready to do all those steps. You know, every day or every other day or three times a day or do this. You know, this is not that simple. It's not. It's not so simple as a. Uh, oh well, I'll miss that dose and I'll just catch it up later. You know, I think this is all very serious. And so uh, I'm just not in a place to even consider that I want to do it, let alone researching the next what, steps. What does it feel like to almost, what, did, what does it feel like to lose to Todd Hutchings barely and know that, that that's like a 5% loss? And Yeah, or, or the even better question, I think it may have been posed to me or I post myself is, uh, what does it feel like to know that you could be that guy? That's what I'm saying. You, 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 you literally could be that guy, not only... There's a progression with steroids also. It, it lifts up your top ceiling, but there's an immediate effect as well. Oh, yeah. It takes yeah. three months and you could be that guy in three months. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a crazy thought. Comes back down to drivers, right? I think if I was still that achievement driven fifth grader, oh yeah. yeah, win at all costs, you know, flip every switch possible, but <laughs> principles, right? And it, it's not necessarily like principles in terms of like moral right and wrongs. It's just, there's a, principled stance that like if i'm gonna do it this is how it has to be done you do it for yourself not for for society as well correct but it's also like it has to be done the right way Mm. and i'm not ready to do it the right way in terms of research actions taken um and that sort of thing how do you feel about people lying about their gear use in arm wrestling in particular i didn't even know this happened Mm. i knew that people didn't like to talk about especially at the waf which by the way i find shameful that people get caught at the WAF, like one of my friends got, I think Trubin got caught once as well. But it, so. people should not be using steroids at the WAF. That's a tested event. In in the powerlifting world and the other worlds, it's very shameful to use steroids at tested events. This is cheating. So this is a different you know ball game. But I was shocked recently. I have to comment on this. This is really shocking. So Ryan Blue Bowen apparently has been challenging you and uh, RVJ to matches. And I think RVJ to put up some barriers, told him, you know, you you have to go get tested and so on. I was shocked to follow this. Like this way later, months later, I, I found out Arm Wrestling's big on YouTube. I followed all the videos and I was shocked that, that Blue Bowen mentions to RVJ that I may have used a compound a long time ago, could still be in my system. Now I want to comment on something as, a, as an expert on the subject. I hadn't watched Ryan Blue Bowen's videos for two years. The last time I watched him, his voice was higher by several octaves. And then I watch him. Now, he's mentioning that he's not on steroids. He was on steroids a while ago, but his voice is deeper. And not only that, he has a muscularity that isn't natural to him. You can see even me, my shoulders a little bit, because I have a little bit of hormones in me. I don't have steroids, but FSA. These things affect how your body is structured. I can promise you, that Ryan Blue Bowen is on steroids or was in the last six months. He is lying on camera. I think you know that also. Does that yeah. bother you? Yeah, I think, I think 
that, that's about as worse as you can get, right? Yeah. That's got that's got to be like like one of the that's like the eighth deadly sin, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. lying about being natural. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, and I, I think the, the thing that made it worse, right, was uh, especially now you can go back and watch the videos. You can see when he changed, like, and it's not the it's not the musculature; it's the attitude. Is the attitude changed? His whole personality right. changed. He, his deep voice thought, changed. He thought he was going to win this lottery tour, right? Mm. And that's what I think. I was like, man, that must be some good stuff. You know what I mean? Like that's you go good. from nobody to saying that you can win this lottery tour. Right. And at the same time, I'm like, man, I've been telling this dude, I don't want to pull. I'm injured. And this dude is ca calling me out, you know, on, you know, 40,000 people, 40,000 subs calling me out, making it seem like I'm the coward when I'm the one that's injured. He doesn't have the resume to make me interested in pulling him. And then he went and cycled up and that's how he's going to fight. Uh, uh, you know, so, and I don't mind other people using steroids, but I mean, don't come pick on an injured natural guy who already told you there's other things going on. You know? Well, in the, in the world, like in my, a lot of my listeners are bodybuilders and powerlifters. We, we don't like that crap. People don't lie about their use. Uh, maybe they lie about their dosages. Everybody lies about their dosages, but you mm -hmm. don't pretend, you don't pretend to have used steroids a year ago when you're on them right now on camera, your voice is deep. It's not, it doesn't stay deep. By the way, I went off steroids for two years. My voice turned into a girl's voice. It goes, it goes back to normal. Then the musculature never went back to normal. Nothing went back to normal. I could almost, almost been my my savings that he's on steroids right now anyway it really bothered me because i feel like a lot of the antagonism towards steroid use comes from these kind of people and they should yeah. be called out it should be mentioned as someone who's an expert on pharmacology i can say that guy is using stuff and lying to his audience and so on but i guess it makes for good um like content because there's this interesting series called the the, about Ryan Blue Bowen, it's called I forgot what it's called, but it's about the him. Delusional Ryan Bowen. Yeah, it's so funny. It's a yeah. one wonderful series. Okay, yeah. so I wonder another thing. That's that's another thing with Ryan and social media in general is that, like, maybe maybe it pays to lie and misrepresent and say crazy stuff because it'll get people talking and you'll get more views. So that you know, this is a weird time that we're but, in. No, actually, he's gr he's growing very slowly. I mean, his his channel. Look, my channel's a year old. I'm as big as his channel. His channel's growing extremely slowly. I think mainly because it's, look at Voice of Armor thing by comparison. I mean, they're growing much faster. The on the audience respects honesty, and they can see it when it's there. You know. But I wanted to ask you. So, the the match that happened with Devin and and Michael Todd, it has some relation to steroids. I don't think anyone's commented on it from a pharmacology perspective. Um, you you did a little bit. You had a very uh, uh, disliked video on the subject, I think. Yeah. But yeah, I lost. Yeah, I lost like what? Uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a very small subscriber base. But I guess I lost like what ten percent of my subscribers. Or you something shouldn't like have that. lost anyone. Oh, your videos are wonderful, honestly. But yeah. but but did did you see it as being a little bit of chemical warfare? Oh yeah, yeah <laughs> that's what yeah. I saw. To be honest. Yeah, I think I think uh, you know Devin talks about you know, not being committed and dedicated and serious and how he had to go, you know, like into war mode or, you know, whatever analogies he used. And it was obvious, you know, yeah, he, was I mean, fight, he was gonna fight fire with fire. He was gonna be serious. He was gonna be committed, right? And, that, and some people would say the same about me that I'm not serious, right? Cause I haven't, you know, taken it to the next step. Devin was serious, he was committed, he was dedicated. You know, he pulled out all the stops. And, uh, and I mean, it was kind of nasty. It was incredible though. It was, it really, it really was a testament to the power of chemicals and, and, and not much time as well. I well, mean, yeah, cause he was, he was 235 pounds on his deathbed, you know, from deep vein thrombosis or whatever. Um, what in February or March? Fascinating. Interestingly, uh, deep vein thrombosis is common when people have higher estrogen levels. It's really difficult to play with uh, hormones when you have that kind of stuff. But what I saw, what I imagine is there was a lot of insulin and growth hormone involved because his head, uh, he comments on it all the time. By the way, I was actually the first channel, I think, to ever comment on the head growth with growth hormone. And then my friend, More Plates, More Dates, who makes videos on the subject, started commenting on it. And then people started noticing this head growth. I noticed Devin commenting on his head growth. That only comes from growth hormone. You have to use quite a bit of it in an older age to grow a head like that. His head really grew quite a bit. Um, anyway, it was really fascinating to me. I wonder if it does it excite you when you watch that kind of stuff? Do you does it ever tempt you? Um, 
Not really. I mean, I'm, I'm such a um, controlled, like, I keep you're, you're the, anticipating your forward, I assume. Huh? You're antis- I'm sure you're never going to do something that dangerous. By the way, there's no way to do something like that and not and guard your health. But there, there are ways to do lighter things and guard your health, not not growth hormone and insulin. Yeah, but I'm saying it's not it's not so tantalizing. I'm not sitting here like saying, man, when I'm 40, when I'm 40, when I'm 40, like I still I don't have an answer yet. Like I don't even know the answers. Yes, I don't think it's a certain timeline. So I'm not even close. Yeah. You know, um, but uh, it's pretty impressive when you see stuff like that. So, so you're also one of the most interesting things is you're one of the only American arm wrestlers who really knows about the compet- competitive level in the East because you've went to, have you been to WAF by the way? I have not gone to WAF you, Worlds. You've been um, to I, well. chose, I chose Lottie because yeah. um, it's cheaper flight wise, it's cheaper hotel wise. It's in the same place every year. So it's easy to plan. Um, and I don't have to go to nationals to qualify. Yeah, and it's, I'm, I don't fear qualification. It's it's qualification is easy for me, but that's another chip, a trip, more vacation time, more cost. WAF just doesn't make sense. And then um, I think in 2018 I was banned from WAF because I competed in Zlati, so that decision was made for me. Why is everyone banned from stuff when they go to Zlati? Is it because it's professional? Um, because people are banned from WAF, WAL no. and WAF, right? Yeah, but WAF has had some issues um, and, and, and there's been some scandal and speculation. Um, I think in the last five to 10 years, mm-hmm. um, I've heard everything from uh, um, fake drug tests or protecting people that were on steroids. Um, the president is actually Bulgarian. So he's also the head of the Bulgarian Arm Wrestling Federation, if I get this correct. And um, I think he's withheld money from his athletes at times. Um, so just scandal on top of scandal on top of scandal. And so some uh, countries broke apart and started their own organization called, uh, IFA. Oh, that's the International International Federation of Arm Wrestling. Hope that's correct. And they were going to do their own worlds, right. To do things, I guess, better the right way, et cetera. And Igor is kind of linked to IFA in some way. And so they took that as like a threat. And so they said, if you compete in IFA or Zlotty or the PAL Zlotty tour, you're going to be banned from WAF Worlds. How do you feel about Igor's outspokenness recently? Or well, not outspokenness, I guess he's, he's getting asked about, about Levon a lot. And, and you're very you, you're maybe the only person who's competed in Zlotty who'll comment on this openly. I, I think Krasimir commented a little bit, but what do you feel about it? Most people are turning antagonistic toward Igor. Yeah, it's, it's really weird. Um, and I think people don't want to comment on it because like, you don't want to you don't want to say you don't want to be honest. And then Igor or somebody says, you know what? You're not invited. You're banned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah, because yeah, the sport is so small that you can just do that. People can unilaterally just kill you. You know, your whole year's done. Um, it's weird, man. Um, I wish I could say that some of it was just language barrier and just him not understanding what Devin's saying or. Apparently Something not. Like Apparently the, the Russian speakers say that he's like that. Generally, we just haven't been reading Russian for a long time. Yeah. And I've, I've, heard, I've heard, I've heard stories about it over the years or whatever. Um, it's weird, you know? So, I mean, whatever you let people do it, <laughs> you let people do what they want to do. You know. So how do you think the Americans really fare compared to the East in your, at least in your weight class? Do you think <clears throat> any of the top Americans in your weight class, Todd, yourself or RVJ, which are all in going to Turkey soon, by the way, who's your opponent in Turkey? I couldn't figure it out. My opponent is F.A. Kubek, who's a Turkish guy. Okay. I think he's somewhere around 270 pounds. Um, he's <laughs> so hold on. Here's here's how hold on, here's how this started. Right. So I said I would help Ingen raise funds for this. No problem. Pretty simple. Ingen, he says positive things about me. So I, I guess Ingen would have liked to see me compete there. Right. And uh, which is high honor, right? I, you know, assuming he's not just blowing smoke, you know. Um, Ingen goes, you need to, you need to have a match. And I'm sitting here injured, haven't trained seriously since 2019. And uh, I'm like, well, I can't go against Kochak. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, like, wow. I can't, I can't, I cannot pull Kochak. And personally, I said, I don't want to disrespect the stage or my opponent by showing up, you know, out of shape. And he goes, how much do you weigh? I said, well, I'm 235. 
And he said, well, I got someone for you. He's 260, 270, but he, he lacks experience. Uh, and I said, fine, I'll pull the guy. My elbows were starting to feel good. So I said, maybe this is what I need to just, you know, go hard, see where I am. Um, I did some research. He was competing at EAF. Yeah, I've heard of him. He's not in 2018. (laughs) As early as 2018. He may have been competing before that. I've heard of him, yeah. I have never seen anyone take his hand. (laughs) He picks up cars. He's enhanced. He's 207 (laughs) pounds. He's Turkish. Uh, Take it as a compliment. He believes in you. He's got got a much better tan. What else? (laughs) Um, So... Yeah, I might have my hands full with this guy. Yeah, I've seen I've seen him at WAF. I, I've seen him before. He's very he's very powerful. Well, I don't think you have your hands full. But leaving your match aside, what are your uh, predictions for Todd versus uh, Zoloev and for RVJ versus uh, what's his name? Uh, Sasha. Sasha. So um, Todd and Zoloev. Um, I'm leaning towards Todd. Right. All all data says Todd, but supposedly Zoloev is going to be at the weight limit, which is 97 kilos. Yeah. And that is just stupid. Like, I, I don't even know how to assess that. I know. Um, but I mean, time after time, Todd goes over there and just, and just murders those guys, you know, because he's strong exactly where they want to be strong. And Zola Webb is not fast like Rustam. He's not slow, but he's not fast like Rustam. And we've seen what Todd does to Krasimir every time in the hook. We saw what he did to Sasha in the hook. I mean, I don't think it's going to look good for Zola, but I can't wait to see it. It's one of the best matches you could ever make. It's an all-time match. You know? would, you, would you think that if Todd was 205 pounds, would he be the top 205 in the world, do you think? Because Zola is their okay. top. I don't know if he can still do that. Um, Todd's 50, 53, mm. 54. Mm-hmm. And um, he's gotten so comfortable, I think, at a heavier weight. I don't know if he can do it. Mm-hmm. You know. And what about Sasha and RVJ? Um, and just to be clear, Sasha and RVJ is not until like, later in the year. That's oh. not happening. That is not happening in Turkey. Oh, I um, thought that was in Turkey with you guys. No, Rob. Rob works during the summers, so um, he can he couldn't do it. But Rob was our first choice to pull Zola with. But again, we just couldn't get a schedule. Yeah, Rob is a wonderful... I'm hoping to have Rob on next week. I've never spoken to him before, but I'm a big fan of both him and yours. Not because you're naturals, but because I I love your viewpoints and honesty. But what do you think is going to happen with that match? I don't know, man. Um, Again, I I subscribe to the short arm advantage. You know what I mean? Um, Sasho, I think Sasho's 5'3", 5'4", maybe. His arm's incredibly short. People keep saying that Rob's going to take his small hand. As far as I know, Sasha does not have a small hand, which is why he's a great short arm puller. He's got the short arm and he has a decent sized hand. So I don't think he's going to feel uncomfortable hand wise. Um, and then, you know, Rob's going to have to start with this really low angle. I don't know. I don't think I'm very optimistic for, for Rob just because of the, of the dimensions and Rob not pulling someone, in my opinion, at this level. Mm-hmm. And God knows how long, right? And so that would be my plan for Rob is Rob needs to pull these guys more, go into a bigger tank, and then Rob's going to grow. And he's going to fill that new tank up. But I don't know if he's just going to be there on the first go. Um, but Rob's got so many tools, man. You, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's really, really cool. It's, it's an incredible potential. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Gennady. Recently, people have been mentioning, De- Devin recently mentioned that Gennady may be the person he wants to pull. Do you think Gennady is up there in the rankings mainly because of his proximity to Levan? And is not, he's such an agile um, and high IQ puller. And he knows how to defeat Levan. But he doesn't do so, I don't know if he had an injury before, but he doesn't seem to do so well against other people. Is he up there in the rankings because of his knowledge of Levan or is he actually a top five puller? Um, I mean, what do you think with your analysis? Well, Crossing Mirror has been pretty close to that top five range at times. Mm. And I mean, Gennady's gone right through him at WAF Worlds. Mm. Um, but that's one guy, Styles make matches. Um, Gennady has always been like potentially in that top 10, top 15 range. And I don't know if you've seen what he looks like today. 
Yeah. <laughs> do you want to talk about taking a step up, going to war and a pharmacology battle? Um, if you look at the move Devin just made, it seems like Gennady may have made a similar progression. So I don't think there's an argument that he's not in. I think there's an easy argument that he could be top five. Wow. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that also. Because, I, I, because, because if you, let's see, who, who's, who's would be top five? Like you have, uh, or top 10 ish. You have Devin, Dave Chafee, Michael Todd, Jerry Cataret, Vitaly, Levon, Gennady, et cetera. Gennady would arguably be the most versatile or second most versatile out of the entire group. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Extremely versatile and extremely intelligent and extremely able to just totally reverse positions in the middle of the match and actually succeed with the reversal, which most people can't do. He's incredible. The final question I want to leave you with, Herman, I'm, I'm so grateful for your time. The final question I want to ask you is this. With arm wrestling opening up and people becoming more and more interested in arm wrestling, if that top 10 that you just listed, a, 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 a few of them, do you think they would be the top 10 if arm wrestling was bigger? Meaning... Are we, is it such a small pool that people who are not necessarily the top genetically gifted people, if the pool was bigger, are the top 10 right now? Or do you think we have a mature sport? I don't think the sport's mature, but I think once you're like top five in a small sport, I think you're still going to be around once it blows up. Um, I think people like myself, maybe, you know, I might be relegated to be someone's coach or something. Um, but I, I think top five right now, there's such, they're so, they're just, they're freaks. They're absolute freaks, right? Levon is obviously a freak. Vitaly's a freak. Devin's a freak. Um, let's say Chafee's a freak. Those guys are always going to be around. <clears throat> it's probably that next tier right below. And I don't know if it's below the top five or below the top 10. Those are the people that might get shaken up quite a bit. Herman, what the final small question. What did you used to do when you used to come to uh, the gym I used to practice at with Vosgan and Scott? Because you're way more powerful than everybody at the gym. What what did you use? I never saw you go on the table. What did you used to do? What do you mean? I, I never even saw you practice. You just used to chat with us. Did you used to practice with Vosgan? Oh, no, 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 no. Like I, I pulled more than anybody. I never right? saw you practice. So for example, you know, um, you know, someone pulled up a video, I think, of uh, the last time I was in L.A., like, 2017 or something. And it was me pulling with Mendelssohn and Bosgan. Um, and I told him, I said, what you don't know is um, I would pull the whole team twice. Then I would pull a fresh Scott Mendelssohn. Long mm -hmm. matches. Scott would go break. I'd pull the whole team again multiple times. Then I'd pull a fresh Scott. Then I'd pull the team again multiple times. So, no, I, I would say I probably typically pulled more than just about anybody. Did you ever um, come when Devin visited? <clears throat> Have you I ever pulled I, that? I think I, I think I was there once. I don't remember. Maybe not. I definitely pulled Devin in Huntington Beach in 2014 um, at a practice. And uh, that was, I was, I was there for the beginning of Devin's Kings move. You know, oh, so he was practicing it back in 2014. How does your hand compare to his? I'm just curious because you, you have such a power. Oh, his, no, his, well, his hand is much bigger. bigger yeah. But like, I don't think I felt like uncomfortable, you know. Fascinating. Yeah, I wish he's, I he's just he's way stronger. Like we're not even in the same category, man. I wish I had lived. Like in people know like the levels there, right? Yeah. So some people go, "Man, Herman, you're so strong," and there's someone that would, you know, make me look like a boy. Well, you know? not at five ten though. There aren't really many people. I mean, I wish I lived in Bakersfield because I I can understand your the way you explain arm wrestling really well. Like when I watch your videos, especially, I'm like, wow, oh, this is. Like, I understand what he's actually saying. But Bakersfield is a very polluted place, actually. I'm glad I didn't live there. How did you live in? That is, like, one of the most polluted places in Southern California. Well, I never had any issues. I mean, so, again. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's so polluted. I was checking out the, like, it's one of the most polluted. Because I thought of moving there, by the way, because it's it's pretty conservative and it's an interesting area. But then I looked at the air pollution. It's horrible. Well, it's been pretty bad. But, um, you know, being from Louisiana, mixed heritage, I'm pretty robust. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Herman, for joining us. Um, I, I hope I, my my videos about arm wrestling don't get as many views as my normal videos, but I bet this one will get more than the Neil Pickup one. Hopefully, people will go check out that one because it's a way better interview. It's an awesome interview, and Herman really deserves more subscribers on his channel. Thank you so much, Herman, for joining. I hope I can bring you back again sometime. Maybe oh, we'll yeah. Anytime. Anytime. Yeah.
Thank you so much, everyone. We'll talk soon. Say goodbye to H3 for me. Bye-bye. Goodbye, guys.